I'm here because I've been a local church pastor for 20 years and because what I see in the church grieves me. Um, I see things that don't resemble the Jesus that I grew up with. Um, I'm here because I believe every single person in the world is created with the same inherent worth and it seems like not enough people in our government or our churches understand that. I'm here because I have a son who's 12 and a daughter who's seven and I want them to walk into a world that is worth staying here for, right? Um, and I'm here because I want to live with urgency. I want to live with urgency because there are people right now living with ur urgently because they have to. And on behalf of those people, I want to make this day matter. And so I'm so glad that you're here, and that's what we're hopefully going to do tonight. Um, a little bit about me. As some of you know, some of you don't. Um, I grew up in a fairly traditional Italian Roman Catholic family in New York, which means I was raised on gluten and guilt. <laughs> so I have like a lot of pasta and a lot of repentance. Uh, and I still have a healthy appetite for both of those things, you know, 40 years later. But, you know, I did not want to be a pastor at all. Around my college years, I, um, I drifted from my faith. But I, I had these two great stories growing up. They're stories that everyone has. I had the story of a family who was for me. I had a family that said, you are beautiful and original and you can do anything and be anything and we are with you. And that was a, a beautiful story that I began life with. And I had this second story. It was a story of a God who I was told made everything but yet knew me intimately and loved me completely. And so I had these two beautiful stories of a family who was for me and a God who loved me. But I had some false stories too. I had false stories about gay people. I had false stories about people of color, about Muslims. I had false stories about poor people. And those false stories weren't told to me intentionally. They were just simply the product of being around people who looked and thought and believed the way that I did. So even though I had a family who loved me, I had a God who was for me, I had a small table. I had, I had very little people. I was a boy in a bubble. And I got a gift. I got a gift of the city of Philadelphia because I, I was going to school there for um, graphic design and I, I always tell people, you know when you go to the carnival and there's all those fish in the bowl and you throw a ping pong ball and if you get the ping pong ball in the fish bowl, you get to take that fish home in a little Ziploc bag and when you get that fish home, you can't just take them into an aquarium and plop them in, right? Because you gotta ease them in because the system shock will overwhelm him and you'll end up flushing that fish down the toilet. And here was me being dropped into Philadelphia as the boy in the bubble. And I saw so much there. I saw poverty like I'd never seen. I saw diversity that I'd never been around. I started to get true stories. I started to get better stories about all the groups of people that I had incorrect stories about. And those stories began to change me. And I started to live around people. And I got a job working in the U University of the Arts. My first job in college was for their catering company. And it was for, uh, they, they ran a cafe and a catering company for the university. And it was the two guys, Danny and Joe, and they owned the business. And they were great bosses. You know those bosses that let you have fun, but they know when to rein it in and actually get work done. And I got chafing dishes full of lasagna, so I was sort of a hero in college. So I loved that. But I remember thinking about Danny and Joe. Danny and Joe are such great guys, and they, they run this business, and they're really you know, great friends because they got the business, and they actually own a house together. They're really good friends. <laughs> and so I, I, I thought everything but like an Italian grandmother. I hope they find a nice girl someday, both of them, you know? <laughs> and of course, I found out a couple months later that Danny and Joe were a couple. And the sad thing about that time in my life was that if I had found out before I took the job that they were a gay couple, I wouldn't have taken the job. But now it was too late. Now I knew these men, and I was family, and I loved them. And I decided from that moment on, I was never gonna listen to a false story again. And so my life was wide open then, and I wasn't gonna be a pastor. I mean, I was gonna be either an artist or the next Bon Jovi, that was the hope, right? And so, I, but 10 years later, something happened to me. I was sort of drafted into ministry. I was sitting in a church service. My wife and I had just come back to church. We drifted from an organized religion. I was basically a hopeful agnostic. 
And this woman tapped me on the shoulder after this church service. She said, John, I've been thinking about you and praying about you, and I think you would be a great youth leader. And I smiled, and I thought to myself, I know you. You're the current youth leader. <laughs> I, she had done her time. She had paid her debt to society. She wanted to get out. And so she asked me if I would hang out with some teenagers in a basement. How much harm could that do? And that was a pivot point in my life. And I bet you can think about those pivot points in your life and you have no idea at the moment that they're pivot points. They just look like ordinary seconds, but yet something changed. And so I found out that I had this love for teenagers and my faith began to grow. And I ended up going into ministry and, and that worked really well for me for a long time, being in a traditional church and being a youth pastor, being super Christian youth guy, you know. But um, I remember thinking something's happened as I've been a pastor for now five, seven, ten years, I started to realize that my table had gotten really small again. That the church had actually shrunk in my table. That I was only around Christians, only around Christians from my church, only Christians in my church who agreed with me. And the only time I wasn't with non-Christians was to give somebody a meal or to evangelize to them, to save them. And I thought, how sad is that? That I was a much better person in Philadelphia before I was a pastor. And so I said, I'm going to have to start being the pastor that I want to be, that I dream of being, that I feel God calling me to be. So I started speaking out about the things that I was passionate about. I started telling those true stories about LGBTQ people and about people of color and about Muslims and about atheists. And so I remember getting into, you know, this new church in Raleigh, North Carolina, and we were there about five months and I felt God calling me to leave that church. And it came in the form of my pastor's voice saying, you're fired. <laughs> I'd like to say it was in my quiet time and it sounded like Morgan Freeman, but no, it was just at a Starbucks. I was fired at a Starbucks and I don't even drink coffee. And I was devastated. Um, but I realized something in that moment. I got a gift. I got a gift that I could now ask anything and I could say everything. And when you can ask anything and say everything, whether in your spiritual life or in your marriage or in your career or with your family, when you can ask anything and say everything, you never want to give that gift back, right? And so I started doing that and I, I didn't have a job for the first time as a pastor in 17 years and I wrote this blog post called If I Have Gay Children and the next day CNN called and the world exploded and I realized I now had my bigger table. I had the chance to tell people things that I didn't think they were hearing. I didn't have to be beholden to a community. I didn't have to say the right things. I could just speak whatever my heart told me to say. And so that's what I've been doing. And I've been working on how to create redemptive communities where people can all be valued and loved and received. And so two years ago, I started writing this book called The Bigger Table. And the idea is that, yes, there is a way to do community that, that may be better than we've been doing it, especially in the church. Can we get disparate people together and actually do something beautiful? And I was so hopeful when I wrote it, and I was so energized, and I was so optimistic when I started writing this book two years ago. And then we had a presidential campaign. Then we had an election. And now we've had almost a year of a presidency and I wanted to cancel the book. No, I didn't want to cancel the book. I just knew it was gonna have 200 empty pages and it was gonna say, I got nothing, right? Because that sense of optimism was stolen from me. I lost that sense of possibility that I started writing with. And I had to say, right before the book came out, do I still have that sense of possibility? And if I don't have it, well, I'm not gonna stand by this thing that I've written. And I realized, no, there is possibility. There is hope, there is joy. And it is in the faces that are staring back at me right now. That this is the reason we keep going because there are people who feel the way we feel. There are people whose hearts bleed for what's happening right now. And if there's something that can happen right now, it's that you can look around and say, okay, I'm not alone and I'm not crazy. Or if I'm crazy, I'm in good company. <laughs> or in my case, I'm not going to hell. And if I am, it's gonna be a lot of fun because there are some really cool people gonna be there. <laughs> but I've, I'm more certain 
now than ever that a bigger table is needed. Not just in the church, but that in our country. But I, I know there's an urgent need for it, but I do know there are more barriers to it than ever before. And so I want to talk about that tonight. So I want to ask a couple of questions of you to think about. Is diverse community still possible here in America? Are, are we able to all be together or are we doomed to be separate tables with deal breakers and litmus tests and things that we can't, non-negotiables that we're not just gonna be able to get over? Is the table ever gonna be big enough and do I really want it to be? See, someone told me when I go to a gathering like this, I was speaking at a Unitarian church on Sunday last Sunday. And someone said to me, I love that you're going there. It's sort of though like you're preaching to the choir. I said, I don't know if you know a lot of choirs the way I do. They need some preaching too. <laughs> and he, but he was basically saying, you know, you're going to go with people who agree with you. But I said, we all, let's say we all agree. I know we don't. We don't agree on everything. We don't agree on religion. We don't agree on political parties. I know we don't. And we better not because if we all agree on those things, then we are not a diverse gathering. And that's the challenge for the choir, if there is one indivisible. The choir is, the challenge for us is, I have to decide, do I want diversity to mean from the center to the left of me, or do I look to the right, and am I willing to try? And right now, I'm not sure. Right now, I'm not sure. I mean, my faith tradition says I'm supposed to love my enemies. That was a lot easier when I thought there were less of my enemies or they weren't so close and loud and in my family at Thanksgiving. Hallelujah. No, and so I'm, there's a challenge here for us. What is diversity to us? And is it a controlled diversity? And the other question though, as we try to make diverse community happen, as we try to bring more people into the table of our community, do we risk sacrificing marginalized people on the altar of that diversity? And here's what I mean. I'm trying now to make sense of this political environment and this environment in our country, and I'm trying to reach to the people who I don't think are reachable. And as I do that, marginalized communities are saying to me, John, don't do that because those are the people who have damaged me. And so I have to hold this tension. I know you feel it. I want to be the person at the bigger table. I want to be the person I used to preach that I was or believe that I was or hope that I was. But now that I'm faced with this, I don't know if I can really be that. It's amazing how much one day in November can change everything, isn't it? If my wife were here, Jennifer, she would tell you that I'm a pessimist. I don't like that term. I like to say that I like to be prepared for the worst case scenario. <laughs> and that I'm usually sure the worst case scenario is coming, right? I anticipate the, the worst outcome so that I can have emotional and tangible preparations made. And if, I, if I'm a prophet, then I prophesy on the side of disaster right? Doom and gloom, that's me. And so election day was approaching, and my wife would say to me, here's the data, here are the polls, I'm going to talk you down now because I see that you're freaking out, because I would say, the worst is about to happen. And she'd say, no, you need to relax, you have lost your mind. And so we had this conversation and even though I said it, even though I said, I know who's going to win the election, even though I was sure the worst thing was going to happen, I really didn't in my wildest dreams imagine it to be possible. That, that a certain level of cruelty and malevolence and bigotry would somehow win the day. I, even though I said it, I really didn't want to believe it. So I said to my wife on the evening of the election, I said, here's my plan, dear. I'm gonna take half an Ambien. I'm gonna to go to sleep at 8 p.m. And at 11.30, or I said, wake me up if we get good news. So the next thing I knew, I looked at the clock, it was 8.30 p.m. I said, I better take the other half of that Ambien. And I got up and of course, we saw what happened. Tuesday turned into Wednesday and, and sort of like, that nightmare 
of a few hours happened, reality began to sink in. And it began for me, what I know it began for many of you, a, a, an intense time of grieving. Like, not just a symbolic thing, not just a figurative idea, but deep, profound, real loss, as real as any loss that you've ever faced. And we grieved since then on two levels. We grieve the big things, like the, we, we, we grieve the idea of country, and we, we, we grieve the idea of the church and of America, and those big and distant things, but we also have grieved those close things, haven't we? Th those intimate things in our lives, right? It wasn't just who ascended to the highest office in our country, it was all the things we learned about our country and our racism and our divisions, and we thought things were better and they really weren't. And we learned stuff about our neighbors and we learned stuff about our family members and we saw our pastors post stuff on Facebook and everything felt tainted, right? Our families and our churches and our marriages and our workplaces suddenly became hostile territory. Holiday gatherings turned into these minefields that we have to navigate now. Our church in Raleigh, North Carolina, we're a really progressive church. So if they're centered to the left, we're going to be at that window, right? Or so we thought. See, most of our church community, we have been doing something called deconstructing our faith, which means you look at the faith that you grew up with and you're thinking, this is not working for me, and you start to take it apart. We have a lot of people in our church who are doing that theologically, religiously. However, we didn't realize that they had held on to their old politics somehow. And so we thought we had a certain group of people in our community, probably what you would assume about yourselves right here in this gathering. And then in the wake of the election, we found out, no, that's not the case at all. And we had a really divided community. And here was the funny thing, friends. Our problem in that church was now diversity. I've been a progressive pastor for 20 years preaching, you people over there, you got to welcome us. And now that I found out they were in our community, I thought, how can I get them out? So I was facing my own fraudulence. And we can talk all about why my fraudulence is okay because those people are this and that. We can say that, but still, I've got the gut check as a human being, not just as a Christian. Am I gonna be a person at the bigger table when the people coming to the table are people I don't want at the table? It's like all our systems have been contaminated, everything that we have close to us, everything that we rely on. A friend asked me recently, she was interviewing me for her podcast, and she said, so how are you like, retaining your sanity? How are you holding on to what you need to hold on to? How are you staying, you know, staying stable? And I said, wine and chocolate. <laughs> That's really all that and my family occasionally, right? But we all have those things now where we're just thinking, I can't make sense of this world. I thought I knew this world. I thought I could have figured that. I'm 30, 40, I'm 50 years old. When am I going to figure this stuff out? And it isn't just these relationships, right? It's the fundamental stuff about peace and rest and comfort and how we orient ourselves in the world. Like that stuff, my idea as a Christian, just about what I see God as changed. How do you deal with that? I lost my dad four years ago, really suddenly. He was on a cruise. He was going on a cruise for his birthday. I called him and got to talk to him on Friday night, and we talked to him about the kids' Halloween costumes. It was, in some, and it was around this time of year, and I hung up the phone, and the next day I got the call that he had died in his sleep on the ship. And I got that phone call from my brother, and it was, it was like an atomic bomb dropping on me, and I just remember collapsing to my knees in the middle of the yard. And then 30 minutes later on that same day, I was at the grocery store buying bananas. And I remember picking up the bananas and thinking, John, this is ridiculous. Your father just died and you're, getting, you're at the store with bananas. What are you doing? And I was like, well, we don't have any more bananas and we need bananas. I have to live. I have to do something normal in the face of this really horrible thing. And friends, what I think we need to do right now is we have to figure out how to go and get bananas and not go bananas. Like we need to figure out how to live again. 
Many of you have had your lives put on hold or you stopped doing the things that you used to do that you loved or you're feeling a heavy sense of sorrow. And so if there's anything that we can do tonight to think about how to begin to live again in the face of the grief that we're facing, how do we respond to this sort of renaissance of instability, instability that we're feeling? And there's just so much vitriol that we're facing, right? So much anger out there. How do we live? And for me, I want to just share with you what the bigger table means to me so we can kind of talk about that a bit. The idea that I had was that we would create a bigger table, and my context was the church, but your context can be this community, it can be this state, it can be your group of friends. I thought about my childhood growing up. And I thought about the table. And I grew up, like I said, as an Italian in you know, uh, a family of four, uh, four kids. And we had a house. We always had a house. But we didn't need the house. The house was just an expensive, elaborate covering for the kitchen. <laughs> right? I mean, that's where we lived, right? That's where we just sat, and I had my chair and my spot, and day after day, we would sit, and we would talk, and we would laugh, and we would tell stories, and we'd gossip, and we'd argue, and we'd entertain, and we'd catch up on life, and we would eat and eat and eat. And at that table is where we became a family. It's where our, I had my spot, and I could just watch it all. And some of my sweetest memories are of being at that table. You know what it's like when, you, when you're in a place where you're welcomed and known, right? You know what that feels like. And like we had, it was great, but then we'd have those special days where we would have, it'd be like a holiday and we'd move up to the dining room table. And moving on up, and we'd go there and there we'd have more people there. And on really special occasions when we had a huge crowd, my father would do construction work. He would actually go into the garage and get two big slabs of wood and he would ask us to pull the ends of the table and it would open up and he would put those slabs of wood in and we would pull up more chairs and we literally expanded the table to welcome more people in. And growing up as a Christian, I, I realized that that's what Jesus was doing his whole life. He was meeting with people. He was breaking bread with them and sharing meals and saying, I see you. You're known. You're loved. You're heard. You're respected. And I thought, okay, if I feel that way in my family and if that's what my faith tradition is, I want people to feel that. So my idea was the bigger table is going to be built on four things, four legs of this table. The first is radical hospitality. Radical hospitality is simply the Italian mother welcome. Right? You are smothered with love, affection, food, whatever. Because you know what it's like? You know what it feels like when you're in a room and you're celebrated? Do you know what that feels like? You do? I sure hope so. But you know what it feels like when you're tolerated. And you know what it feels like when you're not welcome. And no one has to tell you any of those three things. You just know without words. And so radical hospitality is you know that you are celebrated. Because my faith tradition, I'm not taught to tolerate people. I'm taught to love them. So radical hospitality. The second leg of this table is total authenticity. Here's what I mean. Organized religion, or sometimes our circles of friends, make us partially honest people. We realize when we get into a group, or a, or a club, or um, a political organization, we read the room. And we say, I can share this. This will get me into the community, I'll be enveloped in the community with this, but if I share this, that's probably gonna put me to the periphery of that community. The church does that more than, better than anyone, right? If I share this, we have relationship. If I share this, you're out. So what would it be like if we could create a community where we have total authenticity? You can be a non-edited version of yourself and know that there are no deal breakers and nothing to disqualify you. The third is true diversity, okay? We're gonna talk about this for a minute because that word is so loaded for so many of us. See, churches, they're all diverse. They all say that, right? They go, we're, we're diverse and we're welcoming. And then you get there and you realize they don't welcome all diversity, right? They have a diversity that maybe the pastor is comfortable with or their church group is comfortable with or maybe their denomination. But if someone become, is too right or too left or too aggravating or too needy, then they're usually not really welcome, right? Most of our churches are less diverse than our social gatherings, and there's a reason for that. So what would it be like if we could have communities where we have the full expanse of humanity represented there? 
Now, I want to talk to you about diversity because you are the choir that I'm preaching to right now. Because people say to people like us right now, oh, I see you liberals. You're all for diversity, but you don't want to welcome me now, do you? And I say, I don't, but I will. Because, but here's the thing, diversity does not equal tolerating violence and injustice, right? They're different. Wait, the table is bigger, not because you can come and say and do anything you want there. The table is bigger because everyone's inherent worth is valued there, and the people who've been marginalized and oppressed, they need that more than you do. So you're going to be welcome, but you're not going to be able to do whatever you want because here's the deal. If I ask someone who's been raised as a Southern Baptist white man and he's in his 60s and if I ask him and a transgender teenager to come to the table together well it's a much greater ask for her isn't it because she's giving up far more to be at that table with him and her identity her very worth is being questioned so as I call people to the table and as we talk about diversity yes we would be open to someone coming but they have to agree to those non-negotiables and if one of those non-negotiables is not seeing the other person as inherently evil then they're going to have to respect that. And so I tell people, Trump supporters are absolutely welcome at my table. The problem is right now, I'm not sure if they support him, if they would want to be at the table because those non-negotiables may not interest them. Radical hospitality, total authenticity, true diversity. And the fourth one, which is really hard. If you grew up in the church or you consider yourself a Christian, agenda free relationships. See, I was taught that every relationship I had had an agenda. It was to save you from going to hell. Now, that is a worthy thing if that's what you believe. However, I realized that all my relationships were built around the idea of getting someone to make that decision, and I really didn't care as much about them or hearing their story as much about changing the trajectory of their eternal life. So what would it be like to have agenda-free relationships? Maybe with someone you don't agree with politically, maybe with someone in your family who you're really having trouble with, to sit with them and say, I'm gonna hear your story and I'm not gonna to try to change or renovate or fix or save you. I'm just gonna sit with your story and realize that it's as valid as mine. See, what I had to realize in the wake of the election is people who voted differently than I did voted for the same reason that I did. In fact, I was talking to a, a transgender teenager in a coffee shop about this idea of the bigger table. And right outside the coffee shop, just like a window like that, was a guy carrying a sign saying that she was going to help. I call him sign guy. And she said, John, how do I love and how do I welcome to my table sign guy? And I wanted to phone a friend. I wanted to get out, right, because I realized that I had just been asked a question that I didn't have an answer for. And as a pastor, you don't do that, ever. And I thought about it, and I said, here's what we do. We look at Sign Guy right now, and we realize that Sign Guy, at this very moment in his head, is doing the very same thing that we're doing in our heads, trying to hear the voice of whether it's God or the universe or just plain old human goodness and to respond to that voice. In his mind, he thinks he's doing something beautiful, somehow. It looks horrible to me, it feels horrible to you, but can we look at that person and say, in his head, he's trying to do exactly what we're trying to do. And can that be the seed of the table? To say, I, don't, I know you don't know how this looks or feels to me, but I know how it feels to you. So that's the bigger table. The struggle that we're having right now, I think, for most of us is that our worst nightmares have come true. I remember sitting on the bed with my wife the day after the election and we were crying. And I remember thinking and we're talking about it. I remember saying, maybe it's not gonna be as bad as we think. And it's been worse. And we can name that, it's okay, right? But The question becomes now, what do we do? What do we do now that it's the worst case scenario? 
one thing we do is we realize, well, we're still here. That we are still physically here, that we have our gifts intact, intact and our passions intact and our families intact and our relationships. We have enough stuff right now to live in this moment and to say, I'm going to try to get to the next one. I'm going to try to do something redemptive and beautiful on the way. So that's what's great right now. This moment, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. We're trying. We're trying to get bananas. So, you're the resistance. You may not name yourself that, but I'm gonna name you that. You're not the resistance to a person. You're the resistance to discrimination and bigotry and hatred and closed-mindedness, right? You're, you're, you're gonna resist those things whether someone is in office or not. It just so happens that right now you have a focal point and that may be a good thing. Because maybe there would be no other way we would be in this room tonight if we didn't have such a clear idea of what we're resisting. So now, now we're dangerous. You are dangerous in that way. We need to be loud now. Not abrasive, not meeting vitriol for vitriol, but we need to be loud. We need to resist boldly and consistently and in a barrier-breaking, bridge-building way. We need to be that presence. That's the only way this is going to work. There are days when I get it wrong and I attack and I say horrible things. But I know that's not going to be the way that things get better. Things are going to get better when I tap into the deeper humanity that I have and that I, I'm fighting for. I was in Murfreesboro, Tennessee last week, and I got invited to a gathering called A Seat at the Table. How cool is that? They didn't do it for me. They've been doing this. And this was started by my friend Jason, who I write about in the book. He's a Christian man and, um, and, a, and a Muslim family. And, and this Muslim family hosted A Seat at the Table. And I sat with 30 people last week in a room, in a banquet room, and I met this couple and their children, Muslims. I met three people from Puerto Rico who still had not heard from family members. And the one gentleman said, I've been, I've been walking dogs and fixing things just to make whatever money I can to send it to Puerto Rico. And I, I met a couple from Bangladesh who have lived here all their lives and said, I've felt safe here my whole life until this year. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to Christians who were in their church. There were, there were Christians there who were just disenchanted with their faith. And we sat around that room, though, and I, like, I was fighting back tears the whole time, thinking it was so beautiful, but then thinking how horrible it was that they were going through this. And I remember thinking, if only those people could hear his story, if only those people could get it, then they wouldn't be the way they are. And then I realized I'm talking about those people the way that those people talk about my friends. You can see my dilemma. I don't want to be, I don't want to be the thing I hate. I don't want to be the thing I'm resisting. Because you know what? We have good things on our side. We have equality and diversity and justice. But everyone who does horrible things thinks they have a good reason to do horrible things. So I guess I'm just saying, let's hold on to our humanity and hold on to our souls because we won't win if we lose those things. So we've got this radical hospitality, this total authenticity, this true diversity, and these agenda-free relationships. And I want to share a couple things with you that I think might help going forward. I think we need to reach out to the middle. Something has happened. As my voice has gotten elevated, I've realized that I'm a voice, but I can easily go all the way to the extreme places because that's where people want to put you. They want to say, you're for me, you're against them, and them over there are doing the same thing. And so, but what we know right now is there are a lot of good people in the middle. 
and they may not agree with us politically, and they may not have voted the way we voted, and they may not believe the things we do about God or family or education or healthcare, but they're willing to come to that table of humanity, and they're willing to listen. I don't want you to be fooled by the voices of the loud people on either end. And I don't want you to become those people, right? Because there's really, the numbers show us that. The voices that we're seeing represent America and Christianity. They're the minority, right? There is the, but here's the deal, they're organized. And an organized minority is gonna be louder than a scattered majority. What I love about tonight is I see a partnership between a civic organization and the church. And this is what we need to be doing. We need to be saying, okay, where are the good hearted people who are willing to listen wherever they come from? This is not a church thing. It's not a political thing. This is a human thing. And so what I need you to do is to be leaving here saying, how can I find more? How can I find the Muslim families? How can I find people, the humanists? How can I get people who are like-minded to say, okay, we can agree on these non-negotiables? Someone suggested this to me, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I'm going to share it. He said, John, at this point, I think we need to be collaborative and get with as many people as we can so that we marginalize the marginalizers, so that we sort of outnumber the people so that the things that we value will have more weight in the culture, and I sort of agree with him now. Not to say marginalize and that we do damage, but that the volume of the voices saying equality, love, and justice are gonna have to get louder than the voices saying exclude, ban, wall off. And one of the ways this is gonna happen is we're gonna to have to be better storytellers. I didn't become a jerk blogger progressive pastor, troublemaker overnight. I was a normal person and I started listening to stories that weren't like mine and those stories changed me. And if there are people still willing to listen, those who are still willing to listen will be changed by stories. It only took me to meet one gay couple to know that all my false stories needed to go, right? It only took one Muslim family to invite me to dinner to realize how stupid it was that I vilified a whole faith tradition growing up. So we have to be storytellers. This is the power that we have. And then I think you need to develop your personal activism. Now we're doing this together. This is a corporate work of activism. But people think activism is just standing in a street with a sign yelling at people across the street with different signs. That is sometimes what activism is, but it's so much richer than that, and it's so much more redemptive than that, right? So I want you to think about, what is my personal activism, right? Because activism is simply using whatever privilege and good fortune and resources that you have to lift up the voices of those who have less of those things. Right, so use your position and your privilege and your resources and your circle of influences to lift up the voices of people who have less. So how are you doing that? Activism is simply the opposite of inactivism, and I don't want to be inactive as a person of faith, as a human being on planet Earth, I want to be active in this thing. I want the, my inner convictions to actually alter the planet, and I know that's why you're here on a Friday night. So here's a couple of ways your personal activism could begin. You know those difficult family conversations you have that you know you're going to have, and then when they start to happen, you say, okay, I'm leaving. <laughs> Maybe your personal activism is you say, I'm gonna stay, and I'm gonna take a step forward, and I'm gonna risk the messiness of what's about to happen because at the very least, I need to make sure that I speak what's in my heart so that someone knows so that they can wrestle with it. When I said I'd love my kids if they were gay, I didn't just say it because I wanted to say it. I wanted to hear people, I wanted people to have to sit with those words and to wrestle with those words. So that may be for you. Or maybe on social media because I know you like the social media. You know, maybe if you see a friend and they post a, inaccurate stereotype of a person of color, maybe instead of clicking unfriend and rolling your eyes at them, maybe you post on that wall, 
Here's why I think this is an accurate, inaccurate stereotype of people of color, and you can let them live with your words, right? Maybe that small bit of talking to them is activism. Maybe you could say, what stories are not hearing? Do I have friends of color? Do I have Muslim friends? Do I know any atheists? Do I have any friends who are still wearing the Make America Great hat? Oh, man. <laughs> and am I willing to sit with them to learn something about this life from them? Maybe you choose a cause that burdens you greatly. Whatever that thing is that keeps you up at night, there may be many right now, but maybe you pick one and you say, I'm gonna lean into this, I'm gonna find out more than I know right now, and I'm gonna be louder than I've been before. Or maybe you stand in the street with a sign yelling because that is necessary too. What I know is that right now there are people who can't wait for me to figure out how to be an activist. Right now I know there are people who can't wait for us to figure out how we're gonna do this indivisible resistance thing, right? They're, they're living with an urgency that has been thrust upon them. There are people being told that they shouldn't be able to get married, that they can't serve in the military, that they don't belong here, that their religion is a terrorist organization. And so we have to decide if we're okay with that. And I don't think we are. Here's the deal. I, what I'm gonna do is I wanna just share a couple more things with you and then I'll, I'm, I'll stay as long as you need me to stay. We've got books you can buy and I'll sign books and whatever. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to share a couple things before because it's, you know what stinks about this is like this gathering will never occur again. Like humanity will never be arranged specifically like this ever again. And so it's important that we're all here right now. It's important that we're sharing this space and this time. And I feel like when we gather like this, it's like, all right, thank you, good night. Um, I don't wanna just say that. I wanna, I wanna tell you a couple things because I think you need to hear them. You're not alone and you're not crazy. Right? The sadness in you, millions and millions of people are carrying a similar sadness and it may not help you, but you can walk around the world and look at people and say, I know that there's affinity there. I know people are in solidarity with me. Right? I know there are people in this room who think, you've heard a Christian say, you're an abomination. And I want you to hear that you're not. And it's really difficult to live right now. It's really difficult to have hope. But I want you to try. Because you are the reason that I have hope today. I, if I showed up at an empty building, I'm going to think no one cares. But you do care. Or maybe your wife forced you to be here. I don't know. <laughs> but I want you to take whatever was valuable tonight. And I want you to sit with someone else and talk about it. And I want you to go take someone to coffee. Or I want you to write something or create something or do something that gives you joy because that is how we move forward. You know, creativity is powerful. If you used to paint and you don't paint any longer, paint. If you used to scrapbook, keep scrapbooking. If you like to cook, cook me something. I'll be here till Sunday. Do the things that give you joy so that you have a life that is worth fighting for. And I just want to thank you because I, you're doing beautiful work in quiet ways and in loud ways. And some of the activism that we do, no one will ever see it. Some of the compassion we show, no one will ever know. It'll never be newsworthy. I just encourage you to keep doing it. Right? Because this is, this is all we have. Our humanity and seeing the humanity in others and trying to extend the table to people who are not yet welcome. And it's been an honor to be with you. And, you know, we'll be here tomorrow at the church. And I'll be here on Sunday morning. And um, I just thank you for who you are. And I hope you uh, enjoy life tonight. All right, thank you.